have a strong hunch that this is going to be a very fun episode full of questions. So just a small plug before we get started. If you have any questions during this episode, feel free to throw them in the chat. We'll probably wait until the end to address them just because we have a lot of insightful content to go through. want to make sure we get through a bulk of it and then we'll answer questions at the very end. But if you're anything like me and if you wait till the very end to ask the question, you'll forget it. Uh, so feel free to throw it in the chat. We'll make a note of it and come back to it at the very end. Definitely don't want to miss it. All right, well, we will go ahead and get started. All right, thank you everyone for coming to today's episode of Stacking Growth Live. I am ridiculously excited for this episode. Uh, it's gonna be a fun one. Uh, I keep joking that I have a notebook ready to like scribble down so many notes for this one. So we'll see how we'll do that with moderating it as well. But uh, I am joined today by the true experts on this topic who will be going over paid innovations, uh, what they're current, currently testing in the market, tactics you could test as well, insights that they're seeing, things like that. I think it's always fun to see what's the latest and greatest experiments out in the market. Uh, so I will go ahead and actually let Jim Burke and Malin uh, introduce themselves, uh, and as we're waiting for Gitano as well. So Jan Burke, feel free to introduce yourself, give a little background, and then we'll go ahead and get started after Malin as well. Sure thing. Hello, everyone. I'm Jan Berk, and I'm the Group Global Head of Paid at Cognizim, and I'm at the advisory board at Hockeystake. Uh, and uh, I'm actually coming from a law background. I was a corporate lawyer uh, in my previous life, and uh, I'm now trying to do paid, uh, and I just love playing with the campaigns. Awesome. Jim Burke, so excited to have you here. And Malin, feel free to introduce yourself as well. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, happy to be here. My name is Malin. Uh, I'm a performance marketing manager here at Refine Labs. I uh, have been part of the team here for about two years, uh, but I've been in paid media for well over five years now. Um, and really happy to have you all here and see what we can all discuss here today. Awesome. And then we'll also be joined by Gatano as well. I feel like Gatano needs no introduction uh, as well. Uh, so we are gonna be talking about quite a few different things. So it's jam-packed. I'm just gonna go ahead and jump right in it so that we can go ahead and get started. All right, so there's three kind of core pillar pieces that we're gonna touch on today in terms of innovations that we're testing in the market and so on. Um, they're aligned to the different platforms. So we're gonna cover uh, paid search, meta, and then LinkedIn as well. Uh, there's a whole host, again, of topics that we're going to cover within these three buckets. So we're just going to jump straight into paid search. Uh, and I'm actually going to start passing it to the true experts on this call uh, to let them go through what they're doing on paid search, what the innovations are, insights they're seeing, and so on. So Jim Burke, Malin, Gatano, feel free to take it from here. Yeah, uh, thank you for the intro. Uh, what's up, everybody? Hope you're doing well. Uh, I think this first concept you guys will find interesting. Has anybody ever heard of landing page jail? If you haven't, uh, this is a pretty common technique uh, or problem in uh, B2B uh, advertising for paid search. So the, the idea is basically this, you know, like if you were searching, uh, I don't know, uh, best men's walking shoes, uh, you would want to see a short, concise, like e-commerce listing page with really nowhere else to go, nothing else to do other than convert right there on the page. Uh, you would want all the product details within probably some kind of drop down or some kind of accordion or something like that. You'd want to be able to compare like, sneaker A versus sneaker B, like in the same kind of module. And the idea would be to convert right there. But if you're buying uh, something like uh, cloud VoIP software for your sales team or a uh, cloud phone system for your support team, which would require a lot of complexity and integrations and there's probably questions about setup and 
how to get it all integrated, how to switch from your previous provider, all these things that you probably are wondering about. And the only information you have is this. So you would search like best business phone software. You would land on an air call landing page from the ad and you would just see this. You would have request a demo, little you know product screenshot thing there, enter your work email and just like try for free with a couple of like very generic sort of value props, like instant setup, powerful integration, get a 70 day free trial. Well, it's like, yeah, I don't know, right? Like maybe I'll convert, but the problem is that uh, there's so many more things I need to know about that uh, it's very unlikely that um, a, a high quality sticky customer would convert directly on this page from the ad, even if they're already super familiar. So the idea is that landing page jail for complex B2B software is just not a good idea, even though this has kind of been something we've been kind of brainwashed to do, right? The idea has been like shorter pages convert the best. Uh, don't give too many options of things to do. R strip out the navigation links. Don't put a footer. Keep it as short as possible because that's what converts the best. This is not really the way it works today anymore. Uh, you probably could have gotten away with this five, six years ago. Um, I would bet Air Call is probably bleeding quite a lot on this. So, yeah. Uh, next slide. Uh, Jan Burke and I went back and forth on some of this because I've had so many uh, revelations on this problem. Like in pretty much every single B2B client campaign I work with, uh, this problem comes up. And so basically, uh, it's no longer worth it to really obsess over the actual conversion rate of the individual landing pages themselves. Uh, it's better to actually optimize for engagement and quality scores. Unless you are running a product-led growth motion for like a very micro SMB-ish product, um, it doesn't really make sense. So uh, in that air call example, you know, you have two different kinds of customers, really. You have like super micro SMB, like single kind of consultant agency owner, maybe that just wants a, you know, VoIP phone number so that people don't have his or her personal phone number. Yeah, I think it could work for something like that. For that kind of customer, I think it could work. Uh, HubSpot free CRM. Yeah, that's going to work. Pipe drive uh, sales CRM for like super small team. Yeah, I think that can work. Uh, learning management software for enterprise, I definitely don't think that's going to work, right? So uh, most B2B SaaS buyers for those kinds of products just don't convert on that landing page itself. Uh, the majority of the buyers are actually going to bounce from that LP and they're going to go visit the main website for more info. They're going to go back and forth between external sites. And, you know, the bottom line is that if you look at the conversion flows, it's pretty much always homepage get a demo convert or homepage pricing page convert or homepage specific product page convert. It's a very short, quick conversion path for the most part. Uh, so how do you explain that? It's because they're doing the research on all these other channels. They're talking to peers, right? It's never just like search for something, click on an ad, go to that ad page and you know sign up for some software just doesn't really work like that anymore. So uh, yeah, next next slide, if you wouldn't mind, Ashley, thanks. Uh, all right, so page search experiment to try. You could send paid traffic to the main site slash solutions page or main site product page. Uh, I have seen uh, a lot more companies utilizing this technique. Um, in fact, I'm running some of these experiments right now. Um, would love to share some of the results with you guys in the future. Maybe Jan Burke, you've tried this uh, with Cognizant and have some insight on it, but that is an experiment to try. Uh, as I mentioned, like the landing page jail thing is kind of just like old school. So one way to kind of go about it is to use winter to figure out what are the buying hesitations? How do you objection handle that? And you address those buying hesitations on the landing page itself. So for example, you could run a winter survey or just do it yourself manually, but find out 
uh, what are the main doubts or hesitations when buying a, you know, whatever software category you're in. And then you see like here, you know, I actually did this with a client, uh, John, chief human resources officer says costs and ease of use, blah, blah, blah. Uh, SVP of human resources says whether or not we will truly get the usage and adoption. Right. So you find basically patterns in these answers, and then you create modules on the page to address these, these buying hesitations. Right. So that's a better way to go about it rather than just, Hey, sign up and buy some software. Uh, next slide, if you wouldn't mind. All right. I, John Breck, I think this is you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's me. And like, I basically put it, uh, because it is literally, uh, proving what you just said. So after uh, Katano and I discussed, I was like, okay, I have this hypothesis and the landing page content might not be very important uh, in the page search. And we knew that we were optimizing all of those landing pages uh, for the sake of ad quality scores, for the sake of uh, getting better uh, quality scores on Google. And uh, on Google, we had this one keyword, uh, and historically, uh, that keyword has been driving uh, enterprise demo requests. Maybe like 80-85% of the demo requests from that keyword uh, have been all enterprise. And uh, we want to test whether a landing page focused solely on enterprise will improve the conversions, like, you know, uh, landing page about security certificate, uh, landing page with big logos and stuff like classical uh, landing page focus, uh, focus, classical enterprise focus landing page. And tomorrow, uh, it is going to be the la last day of the test. It has been eight weeks, uh, starts from uh, August the 1st. And uh, on the headline side, on the RSA side, nothing changed. So the all changes uh, were on the landing page copy. And if you look at the numbers, uh, the split was 50%, 50%. 50%. The, uh, the test got 1% uh, more spent compared to the test group. Uh, and there's literally no conversion uplift. There's literally no uplift of cost per conversion, literally no change. And this is actually proving like, even if we have a generic landing page for Google search or a totally enterprise focused landing page, it didn't change. And we actually spent a huge chunk of money. It is not like uh, only 500 people. Uh, and after eight weeks, now we can say that landing pages in page search are not very important unless you are running a PLG motion. That That's, that's pretty mind blowing right there. Uh, mm -hmm. One question about it is, did anything change on the bidding? Was it the same keywords? Literally everything was the same, and we use uh the Google experiment, Google as experiment. So like it basically copies the campaign, splits the budget by fifty fifty. Honestly, everything is the same. I'm curious to know what kind of bidding strategy that you use. Was it a manual CPC? Uh, it was phrase match uh with maximized conversions. Interesting. Yeah, I I feel like um. With the you know landing page jail, um, you know, and using automated bid strategy, I feel like it's better to feed Google, you know, more conversions and kind of trying to like uh, you know weed out bad searches uh, or good searches from bad ones, and having that kind of uh, landing page that really does try to capture as many conversions kind of helps feed you know the system and the algorithm. But it's interesting here in your test that you didn't really notice a drop off in conversions at all uh, when you open this up. Yeah, and uh, I think the best thing with Google is, is that we basically sent the data from Salesforce directly. So like uh, the algorithm already knows what success looks like for us. And in this case, it already knew that success for us is pipeline. Uh, and actually, I just saw uh, your next slides, like your menu CPC versus uh, phrase match. And yeah. I was actually going to mention that. Uh, we start with menu CPC. Uh, exact match and actually this keyword is a competitor keyword I think everyone can assume uh, which keyword is that uh, and we started with like manual CPC exact and in the beginning of the year it was really uh, well but then uh, we saw a drop in uh, conversion rates and actually there was an increase in the uh, cost per conversion and we started testing with uh, phrase match maximize conversions and 
like it's been two quarters, results have been uh, remarkable. Yeah, I'm a big advocate for uh, opening up the match types and even, you know, using the automated biz strategies. I think for so long, you know, when Google has introduced stuff and and wants their, you know, advertisers to uh, adopt new features and, and, you know, whatever they want, we are so, you know, we always go against Google because uh, we're in the mindset that Google's just trying to, you know, maximize their revenue. But I think the times have changed a little bit where I think adoption is better now. Um, and certainly in the past, you know, exact match uh, and manual CPC, you know, having a tight control over your campaign and keywords uh, was a thing and that used to work. But I, I, as you mentioned, uh, Jim Bank, uh, in a future slide, you know, I highlight um, how, you know, opening things up to broad and phrase uh, and adopting that, uh, you know, automated systems on Google, such as maximize conversions bidding actually has better results now. Yeah, like now that I'm thinking, I think I only have like two, maybe three campaigns with manual CPC. Apart from that, all of them have maximized conversions. Uh, I did also try target impression share. And I think this, uh, I discussed this with Katano as well, a couple of weeks uh, ago. Uh, and I had this idea, like if your uh, ads are really relevant with your audience, the target impression share uh, will not only give you the uh, whole chunk of impressions, but it will also drive uh, website traffic. In our case, it wasn't the case. Uh, but yeah, probably at some point, I'm going to test it again. Before yeah. we keep going on paid search here and into the nitty gritty, I know we have a couple more slides that's gonna go in even more depth. I'm actually gonna interject a question in here for Gatano because first of all, the landing page jail uh, concept uh, is a spicy one. Uh, it's been a playbook, you know, that's been around forever of, you know, having that landing page. But Gatano, a uh, quick question for you, uh, quote on quick there. I'd love to hear some others uh, feedback about what Gatano just said. I'm currently running a few tests with some of my clients where we're moving away from the jail, quote unquote, landing page to a more product or service focused specific paid landing page, or just going to the main site's product or solutions pages. And anecdotally, we're just uh, we're not seeing a huge difference in data between the two different landing pages, which is leading me to think that people are wanting to navigate the site more, regardless of if they got to the site from paid search ad or somewhere else. Is this the uh, question from Tyler? Uh, yes, it is. All right. Um... He says he's running tests where clients are moving away from the jail to the more informational style page, not seeing a huge difference in data between the different pages, uh, which is meaning, leading me to think that people want to navigate to the site more regardless if they got uh, the site from a search ad or somewhere else. I mean, yeah, that's kind of the main idea where we're also kind of, uh, you know, the consensus is also pointing mm -hmm. to that as well where if you're selling something complex in B2B, even maybe something not super complex, what I found is that there's your page is never really good enough to answer all the things that might be going through someone's mind. Even as comprehensive as you think you might be, you, you probably can go through a couple of iterations even on Hotjar and getting people in, inside your company to give you feedback on the page. Uh, you can develop a super robust you know, list of FAQs. There's always something that you probably may not have covered. There might be something that is just not clicking in the mind of a buyer. No matter how good you think your page is, it may not be good enough. Uh, and so basically uh, to that question from Tyler, uh, that seems to be the the way that it's, it's rolling right now in B2B, that no, no matter how good your page is, um, it may not be worth obsessing uh, on conversion rates on that specific page just because of the way the buyer's uh, process has changed over time. Tyler, anything else you'd like to add here? Any follow-up question? All right, we're gonna keep moving and grooving here. We have quite a bit to go through. Uh, Gatano, let me know, or Jan Burke, uh, where you would like to go next. Yeah, I, I thought this was worth uh, just adding as a caveat as well to people who are doing testing on paid search uh, landers. Um, you know, if you're using winter uh, message testing, for example, you're you're gonna get comments that like directly contradict one another. 
So this, this is literally from one of the Windsor tests I got. Uh, comment one, this page is clear, well-spaced, and has the right amount of information. Comment two, right after that was, this page is unclear, too cluttered, and way too much information. So it's like, you don't know, you don't know what to believe in some cases. Uh, so you do have to kind of take it with a grain of salt and you do kind of have to look for, for patterns that, that reveal themselves among, you know, the big mass of answers that are going to be in there. Um, if you're getting like a lot of kind of back and forth where you see like out of 30 responses, it's almost like 50, 50 down the middle, then you might have to get some, you know, further, um, review from people internally, maybe sales teams, you know, people at your company that really know their shit, but generally you don't get that 50, 50 split. Generally you get a couple of outliers, but overwhelmingly you get a consensus, uh, out of like 30 responses, you're going to see probably 20 that are along the same lines and maybe only five or six that are the outliers. So pay attention to the, uh, to the outliers and have a little bit of common sense when looking at the responses uh, don't, don't take everything exactly for what it is, because you may just have like an outlier here or there, and you don't want to hang your head on that too much. Um, just a quick, uh, I think important caveat to be aware of on that. Great call to have, of course. Cool. These are from my experience with doing message testing. Uh, they are more insightful than heat maps nowadays, just because with heat maps, you're left guessing with a lot of the stuff you're seeing, like, yeah, you know, a lot of clicks going to the most obvious part of the page. What a surprise. Uh, a lot of mouse movement over the most engaging, eye popping sort of attention grabbing things on the page. Yeah. What a surprise. Right. So a lot of the insights that you're getting from heat maps now are not that mind blowing, right? They're not that like, wow, it's more just like, yeah, I could have guessed that. Yeah. I could have guessed that the stuff that gives you the wow insight is the qualitative stuff, which you're only really going to get that through message testing. And so uh, some of the takeaways that I wanted to share uh, over doing this about like 10 times now across different kinds of client campaigns uh, is are these takeaways, which is maybe this is not that surprising either, but users want to see the how behind claims written. So, you know, uh, X percent faster onboarding or, you know, um, much more reliable than Y competitor or something like that. They want to see the deconstruction of that claim, right? So if you're talking about faster onboarding, if you're talking about, uh, you know, improvement in some kind of metric, you should have supporting, uh, claims right behind that overall big picture stat or call out that you're promoting on a page. Uh, like for example, friendly, intuitive user interface, like don't just write that show what is so friendly about it. What is so intuitive about it? Maybe have uh, social proof supporting that claim. Uh, then the next thing is that just overall generic claims are not really believable. Like, unfortunately, like we get in our little bubble, especially with product teams and, uh, the sales teams even. And it's just like, yeah, we're so much, we're like, we're the only competitor that has this, or we're the only company that offers that, or we have so much better. I know, Jambrick, you're going to laugh at this one. Our data is the most GDPR compliant out there, <laughs> right? Like that kind of stuff. It's like really hard to compete on those claims. Um, so most users are skeptical. So you got to do everything you can to try and convince them that it's not just some, you know, cherry picked claim. Uh, to the point of cherry picking, you know, be uh, mindful with the social proof you decide to use. Uh, I know some companies that are serving like pretty much SMB to mid market overwhelmingly uh, as their audience are desperately trying to claw their way up market. And as a result, they're uh, cherry picking these like one or two very, very big companies that they serve. And they're uh, putting those kinds of testimonials all over the most important places on the site to create the perception or the illusion of being like more enterprise ready. But the reality is those are just some outliers, like the majority of companies that are in that company's customer base are very small, right? So that can be a kind of a weird thing. Like you may, you may face pressure internally from executives and CMOs like, Hey, we want to go up market. Let's create this illusion. But it may not be representative of who you actually serve at this point in time. 
And then certain FAQs can do more harm than good. Um, I've seen uh, some FAQ selections that like product marketing says, yeah, this is great. Sales says, yeah, this is really going to help us objection handle. Then you run it through winter and it's like all overwhelmingly negative. Like, oh no, this is definitely horrible. Like this is not something that a, a true person looking to buy this tool would ask. Um, this is something that we don't care about. This creates doubt in my mind rather than certainty. So uh, be mindful about the FAQs. And that's all I got. Yeah, all actually, I got. Uh, that's good uh, right there. Uh, Sorry, go about, ahead. About the website testimonials, uh, we tested something really similar. Uh, we had this case study in which uh, this guy is saying that they saved 99.5% of their time with Cognizant. Okay, sounds great, but like it sounds too good to be true. And uh, we ran this ad uh, as a social proof saying that, okay, this company saved 99.5% time with Cognizant. The engagement rate was by far the lowest. Uh, and it makes sense because, okay, even if it is true, it just doesn't make sense like every company showing that they are they have the best product every company showing that uh they help you save time and a claim like 99.5 uh saving time is good on the case study but it just didn't work uh on the ad site fascinating fascinating um I think Matt had a question about FAQs. Uh, is there an example for that on FAQs? Matt, I, I can't show all the good stuff. I, I can't give away all my good secrets, man. Maybe hit me up private and I'll send you an example. I, I can't leak all my all my best techniques on those. <laughs> uh, and then I think uh, Jamie said FAQ should come from prospects and customers directly agreed. Uh, if If you guys are listening to sales calls, that's like one of the best ways to do it. Um, or just run like some kind of survey or figure it out, like from the actual voice of the customer. But yeah, that, that's all I got. And, uh, yeah, I guess we can move forward. Yeah, of course. Okay. Jim Burke, Malin, we have a little bit on paid search, but we have a whole lot on meta and LinkedIn as well. So let's go over this quickly. And then we'll also spend a ton of time. I, I have a hunch that meta and LinkedIn is going to be some, thought-provoking experiments that you're doing that everyone would love to see. So let's go over this and then we'll, we'll cover most of the time remaining on Meta LinkedIn. Yeah. I'll keep this to under 30 seconds just to keep it super quick, but you know, I, every time I get into uh, a new client campaign and I get access to the Google ads account, uh, I go and look at what has, what is driving the most conversions. And, and as you would expect every single time, it's a uh, exact match brand for the most part. It's, you know, companies just bidding on their own brand to play defense. And most of the conversions come from that. And of course, most companies um, are reporting on, hey, like, look how efficient we are in paid search. And it's just because all those easy kind of handing out uh, flyers to those hungry people already walking into the pizza shop are just converting easily because they've already done the work on external channels or somewhere else. And they're just going there to convert the ad just so happens to be there and it just collects in easy conversions. Um, so I've been challenging that with uh, pretty much every, almost every company I've been working with and uh, causing exact match brand defense on this specific example that I'm talking about here, uh, where we continued bidding on, bidding on the longer tail modifiers. Um, but the results after three months was was basically validated that uh, that uh, we got the same amount of demo demo requests overall at a lower cost. We saved tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, we got fewer exact match brand clicks on paid, but we did see an eight uh, percent click through rate increase on organic brand. So the idea to really validate this is that um, you should see a shift in brand clicks. Right? If you're not bidding uh, exact match on your brand anymore, those clicks should shift to organic and then you should see cost savings, greater efficiency. And um, that's basically just the, the one minute explainer on this. If anybody has more questions, just hit me up separately just to save time. But there you have it. All right. Speaking of experiments and paid search, another one on that 
on the vein of challenging, uh, you know, best practices and so on. Melin, I know that you've been looking at phrase match plus max conversions bidding. Tell us a little bit more about this, what you're seeing, what the thought process is behind it. Yeah, kind of related to like the last uh, slide there. Um, I think, you know, everyone's accustomed to using exact match, especially on branded searches, just to really control, uh, you know, how people search for your brand and how you appear for it. So, you know, exact match as a, as a keyword type, you know, it allows you to really control what you're showing for. And what we've realized is when we ran the three different types of match types, uh, you know, exact being the most in control, uh, broad being on the opposite end, you know, completely uh, loose and, you know, uh, able to capture a lot more than what you're currently, you know, typing in for, for your exact match keyword. And then phrase being kind of in the middle, allowing some looseness, but also, you know, being focused. Uh, we noticed that the phrase match just always outperformed our exact match uh, keywords. Uh, and this coupled with, you know, uh, mass conversions, automated bidding really uh, showed us that, you know, phrase match and automation is, is where you'll get really favorable cost for demos and a higher demo volume. So we've significantly scaled back our uh, exact match spend, as you can see, from Q2 to Q3 and really invested in that phrase match as we're seeing a lot of success there. Hey, man, that's pretty fascinating. I just wanted to ask you something about this because... Uh, some clients have a hard time controlling quality when you're doing this method. So you have to be really vigilant, um, in the exclusions, but I've seen kind of the opposite, uh, strategy where it's like, let's do manual as much as possible, uh, because we feel like we don't have the, uh, ability to be smart with our exclusions. So rather than trying to mitigate it that way, let's go for target impression share and single keyword ad groups. Uh, the problem with that, of course, is that costs will skyrocket. Um, what What's your take on that um, kind of, you know? Yeah, I think, you, I think you hit a good point there. I think to run this type of strategy, you really need, there's two areas that you need to focus on. One is conversion volume. Uh, so to really make use of this automated mass conversions bidding, your account needs to have a lot of conversion data for Google to identify, you know, who's a, what's a good search versus what's a bad and what's more likely to convert. So I'd say your account needs to have over 30 conversions. Um, so this could be demo requests. These could be also, you know, Salesforce integrated, you know, pipeline uh, stages. Um, you know, and as well, you need to be really stringent with your negative keywords. Um, so yeah, broad and phrase definitely bring in, you know, uh, some irrelevant searches. So if you need to really pay attention, close attention to those search terms and make those exclusions, um, you know, every, every couple, every week, I would say, uh, at the onset of the campaign. And then once you have that really strong list of negatives, your campaign will kind of run, uh, really smoothly, uh, going forward. Yeah, in our case, uh, broad match just doesn't work like at all. Uh, and especially there were two keywords, uh, that were significantly weird. Uh, Zoom info, we ended up generating, uh, people who are looking for free Zoom calls. Uh, and the other one was for Apollo IO, in which we end up uh, targeting people who are looking for Rocky Balboa, the movie. Gotta love broad match. <laughs> I think this is a perfect example of needing to find what playbook works for you and your company and your unique needs. You know, just because it works at one company doesn't mean it's going to work at the next. So I think this is a good caveat to have with us. Yeah, to the point of phrase, uh, and then we can move on to meta. Um, you know, certain so certain products have these login portals associated with them for every company out there. So like one example is learning management software, LMS. Uh, when you have a LMS at your company, you create a unique kind of LMS login associated with that brand. And so one example I've seen in phrase where costs have gotten out of control is bidding on certain learning management software, plus uh, not being vigilant enough on the modifiers, you would see uh, not even login associated with that. But for example, like city of LA LMS, because they want to log into it. Right. That's an example where you'll just bleed out on phrase because every single customer out there that has an LMS with your, your solution, or maybe even a competitor solution has a login associated with it. And they're just going to search whatever their own company LMS portal is. Um, those are the things you need to be aware of. Otherwise you'll bleed out pretty fast. 
Yeah, I've I've noticed that too, actually. In this particular example, this data is taken from is a, is a client of ours that's in like workforce management software, and and we see a lot of searches, especially coming in from this phrase uh, phrase match of people typing in their employer name plus you know the the app's name as well or login. Um, so yeah, exactly exactly the same point that you're mentioning here. We, we've noticed that too, and you know we've had to be really stringent with the negatives there. All right, so many good things on paid search. Um, we're gonna transition into Meta and then LinkedIn as well. If you have any questions that we went over, I know we kind of went over that a little quickly, feel free to throw it in the chat and we'll try and reserve some time at the very end. But let's jump into Meta because there's some interesting experiments uh, that, that are going on here right now. Uh, Malin and Jim Burke, I know that you've been chatting about this as well together. So I think this is gonna be a fun one to walk through and it's gonna challenge a lot of existing uh, best practices and so on. So let's let's dive into this one. I mean, uh, with Meta, with Facebook, I still don't know if I like it or hate it, like the whole platform, the <laughs> whole experience. Uh, and first, let me uh, give you a background info. Uh, we had been testing uh, conversion campaigns on Facebook uh, since early uh, this year. And in the beginning of this summer, we realized that uh, our reach numbers were getting lower and lower and we were not able to, uh, to generate the pipeline that we used to generate before. And then uh, we had a call with Ashley and Malin and we were talking about, okay, what we can do, what other uh, things we can try. And Malin, came up with this idea look like I was like bloody hell no and uh he was like why and the first thing I said was that because I listened too much Chris Walker and I just hate look alike but to be fair uh, uh, up until then I had never tasted look alike on Facebook and when he said okay maybe give it a try because it might actually work uh at this point and he said uh but keep to look alike uh percentage uh at one percent don't go higher than that and uh after that call I have created uh, three different lookalike audiences. One of them was from uh, our ISP audience, like one from sales persona, one from marketing persona. The second one was from our opportunities. And the third one was from our uh, close one years in the last two years. And for each of these lookalike audience lists, uh, the audience size was like more than 2 million for each of them. So like all of these audiences needed to refine. Uh, and we created separate campaigns for each of these audiences and divided these campaigns uh, by regions. Uh, on the ad set level, we combined these audiences with uh, broad interest filters like uh, lead generation, code calling, direct selling, uh, depends on the campaign type, depends on the audience type. Uh, and we were trying to limit the audience, uh, but also we were trying to be as broad as possible, but like not like in millions. And can you please uh, go for the second one? Uh, and lookalike was one of the ideas. Uh, and as I said, we tested with different broad filters, uh, with interest filters and uh, some other filters. And I think it is crucial to highlight uh, both what worked and what did not. Uh, later, I will explain uh, how the lookalike audience uh, audience test test. Uh, was like, but before that, uh, I also want to highlight what didn't work. We tried job title and company size targeting filters on Facebook, uh, the new filters, uh, but seems like uh, these filters are uh, way behind of what we have on LinkedIn. I, and I don't think uh, we will have some proper proper filters uh, in anytime soon. Uh, the second thing we realized was that uh, the filters we can use for the marketing persona were much more advanced than any other personas. Uh, we were targeting sales people, revenue people, CSMs, and marketing people. Uh, but we got the best outcome from the marketing persona because uh, the level of filters uh, were really high. And then uh, the other thing we realized was that combining various S into single S uh, performed better than using separate assets. For example, on LinkedIn, we split uh, the campaign teams. Uh, for example, with like product value, it's a different campaign. Social proof is a different campaign. Uh, but on Facebook, 
uh, we tested both with uh, different edge sets and with one edge set. In one edge set, there was different edge uh, with different teams, and the for the latter one worked way better. And apparently, uh, the Facebook algorithm knows what content means what, and it distributes the content accordingly. I'll interject here and just say that, you know, the Facebook algorithm is so much more sophisticated than any of the other paid social platforms we have here for advertising. You know, they've been collecting third party data for so such a long time. And even after they got hit with, you know, the slap with the iOS 14 update, you know, they just collected so much good third party intent data from people that, you know, lookalikes perform really well there, uh, as well as, you know, even the interest targeting, uh, you mentioned layering in some of the interest. I think that was key as well, because, you know, speaking for myself, I just recently, you know, got a pet and I was just searching, I got a dog recently and I was just searching on Google for, you know, you know, pet food and this and that, and I'm getting ads from websites that I didn't even visit. Um, so people, you know, related to pets. So, it's definitely a, a very strong um, connection there from third party traffic uh, with Facebook. So um, I'd say compared to something like link LinkedIn, where the third party data is not as available uh, and used, um, you know, clearly your, your filters here made sense. And uh, the results, like at first, okay, we saw a really uh, high number of demo bookings coming, uh, but obviously we were not sure whether uh, those were qualified or not. And like from the first demo booking to the pipeline, it takes time, it takes uh, some weeks. And we at least needed to monitor uh, the job titles and company sizes in order to uh, make sure that uh, it, the demo bookings were not unqualified. Uh, and here, like what I I would like to highlight is that okay, we have this grading system, list scoring system, but I feel like these systems are a bit over engineering, and I feel like intent is better than any uh, list scoring or uh, grading system. So in our case, we basically check each of the demo requests uh, by their job titles, by their company sizes, uh, and I would say. 80, 85% of demo requests were, uh, were actually qualified. And after a few weeks, we were convinced that these demo requests were as solid as the uh, previous ones. And then I sent this message, to, I, I was like, okay, again, I have no idea how it is working, but it is working. Uh, we generated a huge amount of pipeline and we closed our first enterprise deal. I still have no idea how uh, from broad match plus lookalike targeting on Facebook. And it is still uh, our best performing campaigns on Facebook. Uh, and again, I have no idea how it is working. And I hate to admit that it is working. Just got to trust that I'll go. <laughs> Jim Berg, I think I was right there with you of hating to admit it as well. I think we've been conditioned for so long, especially uh, to believe that look like some work. But again, I think it, I think the, the theme of this conversation too, is you need to find what works for you just because something may not have worked in the past or it works for another company or doesn't work for another company. There's these innovational tactics that you need to test and figure out if it works for your unique, uh, you know, ICP product, uh, and so on. I think the interesting part too was, you know, this was really fighting against needing to have a larger audience. You were hitting an audience cap. And so you were trying to figure out how do we make it go farther? And so this is what really brought us to the drawing board of, you know, if we can also ensure that we're, we're okay with almost taking a little bit of a hit on some of the quality because it is so cheap as well. I think that's another piece of the pie as well as it is a lot cheaper of targeting. And if there's a little bit of like leakage in the quality that comes in, is it still going to bring in a profitable result as well? So just a couple of things to call out in this conversation as well. All uh, right, so, yeah, so I would say put that on your tactics to test. If you have a notebook ready to go, there's the landing page jail. We have a couple of paid search uh, targeting uh, meta look like audiences. So you're getting a tally of all these tactics to test if you have your notebook out. All right, and then on to the next one. Uh, so this was our uh, second experiment on Facebook, uh, but historically this was the first experiment. Uh, and after 
we generated all of the, that pipeline from this experiment. Uh, we basically drained all of the audience. We penetrated all of the audience, audience and we had to switch to broad match. But I think uh, in terms of what Facebook is capable of, uh, this experiment is highly important. Uh, and again, first I will uh, give you the background info uh, on how we started, how we decided to run this experiment. Uh, the first problem we realized was that uh, we were treating Facebook uh, same way as we treated LinkedIn. And we were ignoring the uh, unique channel intent of the users. Like we were uh, promoting all of the educa educative stuff on Facebook uh, alongside LinkedIn. We were promoting product workflows. Uh, we basically had the same structure that we had on LinkedIn. Uh, and we were also using the reach objective on Facebook. and. Yeah, reach is important, but uh, what happens if the reach is too much? And what happens if you keep targeting the same people con constantly? And since your uh, campaign objective is reach, Facebook thinks that uh, this is what success looks like for you. And one day uh, I had a comment, like I had an email from Facebook uh, saying that there's a new comment and I saw this. The frequency is really, really high. I have been seeing this for months. And I was like, okay, uh, this is the wake up call. What we can do? And I was like, okay, uh, we know that the conversion objective hampers the reach uh, and you cannot penetrate your whole audience with the conversion objective. But what if, if you are already reaching all of your audience, if you are already reaching your audience with a huge amount of frequency, then what happens if you change your campaign objective to conversion? Because you, you know that you will already be reaching this audience. So... We tested uh, changing objectives from reach to conversion. And can you go for the next one, Ashley? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, after we changed the objective from reach to conversion, uh, we added a couple of more layers. Uh, previously, we were using metadata uh, for the LinkedIn level targeting on Facebook, but uh, instead of using uh, metadata as own filters, we actually exported a list of 1 million people from Cognizant. I think this is the best thing uh, about working at Cognizant. Uh, there is no data limitation. So like literally I exported 1 million contacts, imported to metadata, uh, and we started targeting with the Cognizant audience, which actually ended up having a better uh, mesh rate. Then the second thing we did was focusing on product quality and social proof, but make sure that uh, you actually take into account the platform intent. For example, don't show a five minute long uh, product workflow on Instagram. Uh, and after having this thought, we actually got rid of 80% of all of our rest on Facebook and Instagram. We left only uh, the simple ones and uh, we changed the campaign objectives uh, again to conversion. But back then, I did not know that it was going to have such an impact. Uh, and when you change campaign objectives on LinkedIn, okay, your uh, in-platform metrics change. You get better engagement rate. If you go with the engagement objective, you get better reach if you go with brand awareness. But on Facebook, uh, campaign objectives seems to be directly affecting revenue, not only the in-platform metrics. This is how strong uh, the algorithm is. And we ended up finishing Q1 uh, by spending 5% more on Facebook and creating 500% more pipeline. And I think uh, for that it is important. Oh, sorry. Uh, for that uh, it is important to tell uh, how to make it work. Like we tested a lot of different stuff uh, before get before getting these results. Uh, the first thing, as I said earlier, the campaign objective is really important on Facebook. Like so much important. The second thing uh, was manual manual placements on Facebook work better than auto uh, placements. Uh, and we now choose what to put on Instagram, what to put on Facebook uh, manually. Uh, we tested with having uh, multiple headlines uh, for each ad because on Facebook you can add like up to five headlines and five descriptions. But to be fair, there was no statistically significant difference between single headline or multiple headlines. Uh, again, we paid so much attention to the platform intent. Like uh, we cut off all of the uh, educative stuff, like long educative stuff, and we left them for LinkedIn. And Facebook remained as a really simple and uh, uh, objection handling focused content. Uh, and 
yeah, we test it with job title, job function list, uh, with cognizant, but we kept it really broad. Like, uh, each of uh, the personas had like at least five hundred k people, uh, and we first start with training the algorithm, uh, with small and quick wins. For example, the first campaign was, uh, number of visitors in the pricing page, then the number of uh, visitors in the uh, demo page, then thank you page. And then the algorithm learned what uh, the win looked like. And then it kept optimizing for better. Uh, and yeah, after one quarter, we improved the pipeline by 5x. I feel like that stat right there is like a mic drop moment. You know, it's insane, especially coming out of meta where we have, I feel like have historically ignored a little bit. This is this is fascinating. Mullen, I know you have your eye on meta as well. Anything you would add on to your questions? Um, I'd say kind of touch on what Janberg just kind of mentioned at the end there is uh, if for anyone in the audience who's wondering, like, how should they build their lookalike on, on Facebook? You know, he mentioned there was, a, you know, a million users that he used from Cognizant's data uh, to build a contact list. But what if you don't have that level of, uh, you know, volume of data? I suggest building, you know, micro conversions in platform on LinkedIn, uh, on Facebook, sorry, um, of people who, you know, visit multiple pages, visit that pricing page, uh, you know, converters who request a demo, any sort of micro action that signifies someone's intent, uh, you know, an interest in your in your product and website, you could really build a large list uh, based on those kind of criteria. Uh, you know, it could be time spent on the site, um, you know, other other events that you can make on LinkedIn, uh, on Facebook, I keep saying LinkedIn, uh, that's the next uh, subject. Uh, but, um, but yeah, if you want to build that list, use these kind of micro actions to, to start with. Kimberg, question for you from the chat. What did you consider as small slash quick wins for this? So uh, for that, I would start with a uh, website with just for specific pages. For example, what we did was an we, we have an enterprise page on the website. And okay, if you're an enterprise company, probably it will uh it will get your attention. And if you visit that, probably you're an enterprise company. Uh and the first the first campaign had that objective visits for the enterprise page then the second campaign had the pricing page visit okay we are not optimizing the campaigns for on the website visits we are not optimizing uh, them for number of mqrs but if someone is visiting an enterprise page okay they are most likely an enterprise company then if they are visiting a pricing page then they are an enterprise company visiting the pricing page so like uh those were the quick, quick and small wins to train the algorithm and once we had uh, those conversions coming then it was pretty easy for facebook to maximize that number but uh before that our uh one of the conversions was like thank you page submissions which was basically demo form submission but uh for that we were not able to control uh the quality like okay everyone is sending the demo request but of who is qualified uh therefore putting an enterprise uh, section between uh, the website and the demo request really help us to uh, split out the qualified audience. Fascinating. All right, so we're nearing the end here. Uh, so we are going to uh, stop at Meta. I feel like we could have a whole other conversation hour long just on LinkedIn with all the experiments that we're testing. Uh, if you're not following Jim Burke and Gatano and Malin on LinkedIn, I highly recommend doing so. They drop a lot of, look, Jim Burke's got his LinkedIn water bottle, perfect timing, product placement. Uh, but I highly recommend following them. They do share you know, these experiments as well. Um, we have just a couple minutes, so I wanna go and transition to um, the questions here in the chat. So let me pull it up here. Um, I think this was answered here, but I just want to make sure that it is, you know, noted here. Talking about the meta piece and those micro conversions that you layered in, were those micro conversions for demand gen campaigns, or did you have the micro conversions used as the first stage as the demand capture campaigns and then added in demo requests as an example once you accumulated the conversions? Second one. All right. Answer right it there. Was just, uh, yeah, it was just too long to answer a uh, second one. It's perfect. 
Um, okay, so I'm gonna actually take this a little bit back to, uh, let's see. I'm gonna take it back, Patrick, let's see, let's get you unmuted um, and bring on this con or question. There was a question earlier in the conversation on broad match. Uh, Patrick asked broad match, as in broad match keywords or broad Facebook audience uh, in the message. Uh, Patrick, if you are here, let's see if we can get you unmuted and maybe add a little bit more color to this question here. Looks like Patrick has left the building. Uh, so going back to this, uh, I believe it was on Facebook. Uh, let's see. We'll, 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 we'll cap it with that one. Um, any last questions? We have about a minute left. Feel free to throw them in the chat. Otherwise, thank you so much, Jamberg, Mullen, Gatano. This was a very fascinating conversation. I think personally, a big takeaway for me is you know, just because something didn't work in the past or wasn't a best practice doesn't mean you need to totally write it off. You need to find what works for you and your company uh, with anything with testing tactics. Um, and there is a lot of really cool, innovative work that is happening in the market right now. So really appreciate all three of you joining us and for everyone who attended as well. Um, continue the conversation. Uh, if you see us on LinkedIn, feel free to shoot us a message or um, in the comment section on LinkedIn. Uh, but with that, thank you everyone for attending and hope to see everyone again soon. Thank you.